Welcome to the Motoring Podcast, a Volkswagen Arteon shooting break, insert your own inverted commas here, special edition. Hello, I'm Alan. Hello, I'm Andrew. You let me off lightly this time, Mr. Clues. I did. I shall take the full title that, as we were given on the PDF from Volkswagen, the Arteon shooting break, Elegance E-Hybrid 1.4 litre TSI 218 PS 6-speed DSG. Snappy. Yeah. The reason cars are so big these days is so you can actually fit all the badging across the back. <laughs> yeah, that and the manuals. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's a manual in it. Yes. Oh, that's true. Yes, yes. Do you remember glove boxes? They're now manual boxes. <laughs> right, I suppose I'd better get on and explain what this is, really, rather than just witter on about that. Please, please. Okay, so the Arteon is the really rather good looking version based on the passat the four door coupe style but they've made an estate version but estate isn't sexy so they've called it shooting brake okay it's a lifestyle estate car yeah it veers more towards the lifestyle end of the scale there is a plenty of space in the boot i'll get onto that but think of it more as uh if you need to haul a load of stuff and you need an estate the passat is more the workhorse version. Mm -hmm. This is the sexier version. Okay, okay. So tell me then about what the Elegance 1.4L hybrid means. Okay, so uh, this is a 1.4 petrol engine mated with a hybrid, a battery electric hybrid, plug-in hybrid Mm -hmm. uh, motor, which means that I get, or I had 218 metric horses, more importantly, though, 400 newton meters of the torques, which was quite Whoa. a lot. <laughs> quite. This was front-wheel drive, uh, not to 62 time of 7.8 seconds, with a claimed top speed of 138. Clearly, I never went anywhere near that. Hmm. Uh, CO2s, as a consequence, were kept down to 26 grams per kilometer. Nice. And a combined WLTP range of 243.3 miles per gallon, apparently. Okay. Love to know how they calculate that, because I got 32.8. Yes, but we'll talk a bit more about that later on, I think. Yes. You can drive this in electric-only mode, and it says that you will get 38 miles on that, or that is the maximum range you will get. Okie doke. In this, there are three types There are three levels of... Trim levels is what you're trying to say. Yes, there are three trim levels. Thank you. So it starts at Elegance, then there is R-Line, and then there is R, which is top of the range, which has only recently come to the the range. They'd always announced it, but it's only just recently come to it. Okay. Um, There's also a couple of pure petrol and a couple of pure diesel engines, and there is also a four-motion all-wheel drive system that you can spec as well. Right. Okay. There, there are many permutations of how your Arteon gets around. It's what yes. I've understood from that. And that seems to include pure stuff and uh, plug-in hybrid stuff. Yes. Correct. It had some extras because it is a press car. Mm-hmm. I had the alternative alloys, which came in at £405. Right. IQ light LED headlights, which were £1,320. Okay. Never really sure exactly what they were meant to do. Okay. Uh, they had rear tinted glass, which cost three hundred and thirty pounds. So that gives the gives me the idea that you could have it without tinted glass, which I know quite a few people in the car corner of social media really would prefer rather than the darkened out stuff. Okay. I like the I like the darkened out stuff. So I'm just going to go. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah, that has never bothered me. It's not a hill I wish to get hurt on, I have mm. to say. Uh, it came with Napa leather, which was oh, £1,185. <laughs> okay, some costly cows. Panoramic sunroof, which was £1,145. Okay. Tire pressure monitoring system, 180 Right. I'm surprised at that. That's not standard, but German car. Okay, move on. Don't forget where I'm at the bottom of the range. Uh, true, true, true. Or the, uh, the entry point. Entry the point's RTM better, range. yes, yes. I think then you <laughs> won't get shot by the PR team. Yes. Yeah, not for that anyway. <clears throat> no. uh, they had eucalyptus interior trim inserts at no extra cost. I like them. 
uh, and a head-up display which was 550. Okay. So the basic car that I was given was 42,225 on the road. With the extras, came in at forty-eight thousand seven hundred and forty pounds. <laughs> it's a, it's a press car, everyone. You don't have to do this. Yeah. Yes, and for those who are keeping count, there is a color tax. So that's why you may have got your calculators out and gone. Hang on, he's not correct. So moving on to the colors, mm-hmm. you can have moonstone gray. It's that flat gray Volkswagen. Uh, yeah, very keen to put on every car. It seems that was no cost, but I didn't have that car. Uh, deep black pearl metallic black that's 680 kingfisher blue metallic that's what i had that is my favorite really and nice that is a metallic mid blue it's lovely absolutely lovely and that's 680 as well there is a manganese gray metallic which is a dark metallic gray 680 pyrite silver metallic which is very much silver and that's also 680 uh, king's red metallic which is a deep red metallic mm-hmm. that is eight hundred and fifteen pounds. My second favourite colour, right? Yeah, um, that they do. And then Oryx White Mother of Pearl. So it's a pearl white. Sit down, everyone, for only one thousand one hundred and twenty of your pounds extra. Oh. Okay. You really, really want to have it in white. <laughs> The car that came to me had wheels that they no longer supply via the configurator and going into the dealership. So you get three options now if you go in on the website today. So there's one standard at 18 inches. Then you get two that are 20 inches, and they cost, again, sit down, £1,035 <laughs> each mm-hmm. option, <laughs> yeah. which seems a little bit steep to me, but... Mm. yeah well it's it's not just that remember it's different tires as well but on the other hand you're not getting the original one so it's quite an upgrade cost really yes i went through the configurator and i spec'd as closely as i could to what volkswagen allow you to pick today right and i came out at a thousand pound less than the car i had Mm -hmm. so i then put that into the volkswagen's own monthly costs and figures in yeah. their calculator, over 48 months, 10,000 miles per year maximum with a very precise £4,712.50 deposit. You, you chose that yourself, did you? You obviously no, put that, that is number what was in. There. That right. is what was there. But there is a Volkswagen contribution at the time of recording, mm-hmm. and that was 4500 which is quite a chunk of change. I wasn't yes. expecting that. No, me neither. You're almost doubling your deposit. Yeah. Almost. Um, that leaves a final payment, if you wish to keep the car after the 48 months, of £15,138.90. But there is an additional £10 if you want to select the optional buy button, which just... Just why? Come that's, on. That is... This- uh, that's a finance department doing its finance department stuff and not realizing just how silly it looks. It looks silly and uh, someone needs to have a word with (laughs) the retail side of things to say, lads, come on. (laughs) Yeah. So what's the monthly on all that anyway? With all that in, the monthly is £601.17 for 47 months. Okay. That's, That's actually, that's pretty good, really. It's just it's just shy of a fifty grand car. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I don't think that's a outrageous monthly. Me neither. You can get far less, far less impressive, far far smaller, far far less impressive cars for about that that same monthly cost as well. Mm. Anyway, Andrew, tell us about the outside. As I said, it is the shooting brake estate version of the Arteon four door coupe style version of the Passat. Oh, it's all, we're almost getting to BMW levels of Don't, don't worry about it. My, my, my next door neighbours have just bought a two series active tourer. So that you can go on like that for 10 minutes before you get to that. <laughs> they basically put a attractive estate back end on top of this really attractive four door coupe. Mm-hmm. And what we have is a widish low car that is very distinctive. 
Mm -hmm. um, has some has some nice little neat little touches on the design. It is more good looking in a conservative, stylish way, rather than what some style that we see. Some car manufacturers have definitely gone down the we're shouting at you, we're shouting design at you. This has not done that. No. Do you know what it reminds me of in profile from the side, not from the front? In profile and at the rear, it looks like a stretched version of the previous generation of Sor of Sorocco, especially the shape of that back window. Funny you should mention that because it has two haunches. Yeah, the haunches at the back are slightly flared. Mm. The way that they've put the estate body on top of that is inside them, so it really does look like those shoulder, yeah. rear shoulders going into the rest of the body. Is it as wide as it looks? Because it is quite a wide-looking car, and I guess it's because it's, it is quite low, you know? It, I think it it's not monstrously wide, but I think that the fact that the roofline is so low and mm. the side windows are a lot shorter than the Passat version. Yeah. It really does make it look as though because that don't forget the Volkswagen front grille now is like a full width thing with the lights that integrated into it and wrap round, so it all yeah. looks yeah. It really does go for the whole horizontal lines to emphasise the width type thing, and that's why I was I was I was wondering about that. But it's a darn good looking thing, and it's a shame oh, though absolutely. it's a shame that you can't get those wheels anymore because they're really nice. They they were one of the things that reminded me of the Scirocco as well. Well, I think the Scirocco one's a 12-spoke, not 10-spoke. But one of the options you can get on the 20 inches are very close to that. They are mm. quite propellery, mm -hmm. uh, but they're two-toned. I, I love, um, really, that's a shame, because what I was about to say was I love the fact that these are just silver alloys, mm. and they just look nice. It just looks, it's a very classy spec, certainly this one, as, it, as it, you would expect for the price. But It reminds me... Or I would I would suggest that like the Mazda six estate, in terms of so good looking, yes, yeah, it's definitely up there, definitely. Up yeah, there. but yeah. but the rear haunches are particularly lovely, and the way that they they meld them round into the back mm -hmm. the the back door and everything like that. It is it is like I say, you just if you glance at it, you sort of go, oh yeah, that's that's a really nice looking car. But the more you look at it, the more you spot certain things, and they haven't gone down the route of oh, we must put loads of slashes and swoops everywhere. No. The lines generally are going from somewhere to somewhere and appear to mean something rather than, oh, look, hang on, we had a, a blank bit of metal. We must do something there. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It's well, it'll be well worth looking at the folks. If you're not listening via, the, via our website, it'll be well worth going to motoringpodcast.com and looking at the, the photo gallery that will be in uh, along with this particular uh, particular episode. Yep. Well, let's do our usual and start talking about the interior. And I imagine there's only one boot, given it's an internal combustion engine car. So uh, we're starting at the back. There is only one, and it is surprisingly big, mm -hmm. considering this is more of a lifestyle-y estate than anything. It's got a nice big flat floor. And then on the driver's side, behind the rear wheel arch, there is a cordoned-off area that you could put, like a couple of pints of milk and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. There are a couple of curry hook right at the edge but i never i never tried them out in terms of how well they held bags and everything no but they 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 they're of they're of the fold out kind rather than the moldy inny kind though yes yes yeah, uh, cuz i used either behind the the driver's seat or in that little cubby sectioned off area mm -hmm. yes yeah uh, underneath the the floor there is sort of an undercroft and that's got the tire inflator kit as well as the charging cable for the fevness that's quite impressive and it's quite a decent size looking decent size and shaped area especially given that there'll be a battery and stuff under there for the, the uh, as a plug-in hybrid you can spec a full size alloy spare really gosh and that's where it fits that's really impressive I don't know how easy it is to put the cable in after. I presume you put the, the wheel downwards, as it were, and Maybe. then you put the cable inside the wheel. But but um, that's that 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 space is still got enough room, and you can spec in the Fev version a full sized spare wheel. That I am genuinely surprised by that. That that's quite impressive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just to finish off the boot, though, but over yeah. the top of the luggage area is a retractable um, soft cover. 
Mm-hmm. So you can, uh, apart from the fact that the, if you don't spec the tinted out windows, because they are very dark, if you don't spec the tinted out windows, uh, then you would use that, and it's it's quite adaptable. So yeah, that's good. Uh, was there anywhere to store it if you had to take it to take it out or not? Or is it is it? I cannot home? remember off the top of my head. I nothing leapt out that it that there was. No, no, it, it it looks like it's a it looks like it's a cart it around or store it at home. It doesn't look like there's any space in the undercroft for it. Uh, there isn't in the undercroft. No. The only thing I can think of is if you could put it in the boot space itself. Mm, yeah, compressing the ends. That would be the only thing I could think. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, it doesn't look like it. Okay, never mind. Anyway, back seats. How were they? Did- it's actually quite a decent bit of room. There are two and three quarter seats in the back there. There's a quite a a lot of leg room, really. Mm-hmm. The the pictures that Alan's looking at, uh, you can see the driver. I could easily have sat behind myself in those classic styly <laughs> mojo things. Uh, okay, I'm just average height, but even if you had someone who was six foot, just a bit over six foot, you've still got adult knee room in the back there. Mm. After that, uh, there is a bit of an intrusion from the transmission tunnel. Uh, it's well you'll you'll sit with your feet either side of it or you'll be small enough that your feet sit on top of it really really if you're going for this you you would normally end up if you're buying this you would expect it to be mostly carrying four people as opposed to mostly carrying five people i think yes i think if you are three people in the back you are looking at one of their suv range Mm -hmm. more than this yes yeah but nice if if it's a regular thing yeah nice big Nice big armrest folds down the middle by the looks of it as well. There, yeah, yeah. The seats are, are comfy as well. Uh, yeah, sorry. There are air vents. Are there any USB charging ports? No, there is a. Well, there's a really? blanked off point underneath that. Oh, there's a twelve. So volt. I think you could probably spec it. I think it's like a a bit of a reminder you're in the elegance. Right. Okay. Okay. Moment. So you, you elegantly you elegantly don't get any charges in the back seat. But there is a charging point in the cubby box, so okay. you could trail a longer cable or splitter mm-hmm. from in there. Yeah, all if is you needed to. all is not lost. No, no, there's ways around. There's ways and means. <laughs> Anything else about the back seats? I was going to talk about it in a bit, but I might as well talk about it now. There is because of the uh, the the low profile of the vehicle, the high shoulder mm-hmm. height, and the tinted windows you could and with the black interior there is the risk of it being a little bit claustrophobic however there is a fabulous panoramic sunroof which i mentioned earlier Mm -hmm. i just had that open and you you had no hint that you know it really felt more airy and bigger than it was right because of that uh, that lovely sunroof Mm -hmm. okay that will be something i was ticking on the options list yeah, you're a bi- you're a big fan of the panoramic sunroof, so yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, absolutely. Uh, what about up front then? I mean, the, the, it looks like there's quite a lot of Passat architecture in there. Yeah, the, there is the seats. You've got plenty of space, but they've sort of continued the vibe of <sighs> it's sort of sportiness. Mm-hmm in this but it, mm, it's not really so you get really comfortable seats they're slightly hugging they're not full on bucket seats or anything like that they're heated fully adjustable uh, and leather this is uh, i'm saying it's got this sort of hint of sportiness and they're sort of leaning towards sportiness in the design and everything i felt it was much more grand tory end mm-hmm. of the scale so this isn't something that you have Particularly in elegance, and maybe it's different in R, but in elegance, this is something that you you can move. I mean, they're going jumping ahead slightly here, but this sort of all ties in together with the design and the way that it's set out and everything. That you can push on on nice sweeping A roads and motorways and stuff like that, and it will be fine on a B road. But you're not going to set the world alight on a B road, and it's not really at its happiest with you trying to chuck it round corners and break 
root records or around the Evo triangle or something like that. It's it, That's not what it's designed for. So don't think of it like that, but think of it as more you're going to be cosseted as you go across... Ugh go across the continent nicely <laughs> this is this is a cheesy you're much more likely to find it sitting at or ever so slightly above the european speed limit yeah going between cities quite comfortably in a grand tour manner as opposed yes. to uh i'm going to take this to the nurburgring type yeah type thing. absolutely <laughs> that's exactly it yes thank you for being much more succinct than me oh i have my <laughs> moment i really like that eucalyptus wood accent by the way yes it worked well it it it, it was a nice contrast i would say that um whilst the interior design doesn't get close to being as exciting as the exterior mm-hmm. it's still a very nice place that they have lifted elements of it with their choice of finish with the choice of material with the choice of color and they and obviously the fit and finish itself is is fantastic, as you would expect from Volkswagen and particularly towards the top end of a Volkswagen range. Uh, yeah, I, I really like look, looking at the photos here. I really like the corner where the in this case the passenger door, the the way that the the door release handle mm. ties into the to the tweeter in front of it ties into the edge of the air vent on the dashboard as well and just yeah. all the individual elements all aligned and all the right same looking materials and stuff and just how obviously somebody sketched it as a whole load of pieces together and said well, wouldn't it be cool if it was like this and it's i would imagine that it has got from sketchbook to production and you could still hold one beside the other and go that's clever isn't it nice that they managed that yeah, they've definitely got a very wraparound vibe, even though the 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 dash is almost flat across. I mean, round the round the driver, it's slightly curved. Yeah, it's slightly driver focused. For for yeah, to be driver focused. But as you're sat in there, it does give the impression without actually being wraparound mm. and curved because of the way that they have cle- they have managed to line everything up, and they've used cle- and they've cleverly matched the materials. Uh, as you as you say, it is it is a really nice place to sit. Mm-hmm. I can see you sitting in there for hours. As again, you know, cliche, <laughs> naff cliche. As you cross the continent and being supremely comfortable the entire time, and it being quite a relaxing journey as a consequence. Yeah, yeah. I'm almost loath to ask you to give us the button rundown because I absolutely abhor this. Uh, but never mind. <laughs> so the. The binnacle itself is one of these uh, L is an LCD screen, isn't it? It's completely sort of I don't want to say virtual because it does exist, but it's yeah. um, but it's just one of these completely you're, you're digital. Buying into based. marketing tech, te- uh, I technology, am not um, buying into terminology it. there by that. No, it, it is uh, Volkswagen's digital cockpit pro, which is a ten and quarter inch TFT screen, and that's customizable. Uh, you get two dials, either side, left and right, as you would expect from uh, from behind the steering wheel. And as well as in the center, I think is now standard practice by everybody, where you can change the sort of information that goes in there, trip computer, navigation, that sort of thing. Standard best practice layout, really. Yeah. Uh, on the left of the setting I had was a hybrid huh, of the power usage and ref counter combo. Um, and then they had the mile per, miles per gallon in the center of that. And on the right was the speed of the vehicle, as well as the range of the car then in the center of that. Mm. So there is quite a lot of information in that screen. If But it's very clear. It's it's the yes. best of German layouts before. You know, sometimes some German brands go a little bit, look at all the things we can do. Now we have a screen. Whereas this is, okay, we have a screen. Let's make it really, really clear. I particularly like that the range on the in the middle of the speedometer on the right-hand side is the combined petrol and electric range. Yes. Yeah. No, it is. It is because it, it, when when I was reading about what was possible, I was like, oh, that sounds like an awful lot. 
once you put it up there and the fonts they've chosen and the and the way that it's laid out they've kept everything separate it's not all cluttered mm. so they've managed to keep it separate uh, and done a really good use of the the made a really good use of the space that they have available without trying to fill every millimeter with something yes yeah which is, which is tiresome and difficult to read if you're on the move yeah, yeah, it really is. But don't forget, it also had the head-up display. So oh, right. the key info I wanted was on the head-up display. Like, what speed am I doing? What speed mm-hmm. is it? Well, it's What's the speed supposed limit? to tell me what speed was the limit around, and then uh, any directions. But we'll get into that when we get onto the technology. Okie doke. Okie doke. Great. Uh, central binnacle, then there's touchscreen. And there's a note here which says, Arteon Filthy Touchscreen is the name of the image. Andrew, how did you get and on with is. the touchscreen? <laughs> uh, yes, right. Okay, so this is an eight-inch color affair. Uh, it had the usual functionality that you would expect, so built-in sat-nav, which was very good. Mm-hmm. Volkswagen sat-nav is it very is good. It is excellent, isn't it? I, I ended up using it over CarPlay on the ID3. Oh, yeah. I, I try and use the inbuilt when I've got a car for a while. Because I know I can I can drop back to Apple Maps if it's not doing what I'm expecting it to do, mm-hmm. um, but I never I never wanted to leave that. It was a really good layout. The directions were excellent in it, and the and the options you had of how it displayed the information was really good as well. Mm-hmm. So I like that. Uh, DAB radio sync in your phone, Apple CarPlay, Android Auto, but it's also got that phone mirroring as well. Oh, right. So if you do it via Bluetooth only. Mm-hmm. Although Apple CarPlay and Android Auto was wireless as well. Oh, right, cool. Um, once you'd synced it with the wire once, you could say, I will have this wireless from now on, please. Oh, that's really, that, it, a wireless CarPlay is really useful, especially if you've got a, a if there's a, a Qi charger in the car as well. Yes. Yeah. Then you just get in, put it on, start the car. It all works. It's wonderful. Yeah. Now, the okay, so what the infotainment system had was fine. How you use that, I was less happy with. Right. So it had touch buttons, which are just areas that you are to vaguely stab at and hope you have <laughs> pressed. Regular followers of Andrew's Twitter's feed will not be surprised at this reaction. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, really not helpful if you're driving mm. it's it's one of those passenger it's fine because you've got time to steady your hand and be looking at what you're doing but they were just unusable if you're driving unless you took your eyes off the road which is not what you want to do no there's also a volume dial on the left and another dial on the right but the volume dial it has the decal on it and it moves and stays in the position that you've twisted it to i am very sorry everyone to whom that offends please do not shoot the messenger this was not my request and i am just reporting what it does it's a volkswagen group car they they all do that so yes that irritation exists in all of them but of course if you're like me you could make sure you just leave it up the way and then use the buttons on the steering wheel to change the volume instead yes ban passengers from touching Mm. them (laughs) right underneath the screen are some more flat surface buttons or areas that you stabbed at for the heating and climate controls including the seats again i do not like the flat button design where you are it's fine if you set and go Mm -hmm. but if you need to adjust while on the move very unhelpful and was there voice control so could you do it by voice instead i didn't test that out okay there is voice activated stuff in the car but I didn't test whether there was a particular phrase. I presume there is a particular phrase. <laughs> Bleep, turn it on, yes. Yes. No, we do not recognize that <laughs> command. Say <laughs> it, yeah, come in. Try again. Yeah. <laughs> but under that is the flat Qi charger area, um, and then you move down to with what they have, again, sort of giving this impression of being cosseted, is they've slanted from the central binnacle area the the down to the transmission tunnel slightly slanted at an angle mm. uh, as you come down from the gear lever through to the cubby box in between the seats so we start up there after the chi charge and you've got the gear selectors right and either uh, uh, beside that you've got um some buttons 
There was many blanked buttons because I was in an elegance and I was reminded of exactly where I was in the Volkswagen spec game. <laughs> so, is they're still better than they ever used to be. I mean, yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that had uh, the driver modes uh, buttons as well as a couple of other things, sort of like the eco and that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. After that, you had uh, two nicely sized cup holders on the right hand side, and on the left, you had the electronic brake and auto hold button. Um, there was another odd small storage slot, which I think you could probably stick your phone in if you wanted, or the passenger could while they were charging it or something, if you stuck it on its end. Anyway, it wasn't blank space. No, it, it wasn't blanked off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then there was a, a 12 volt charging port and then finally there's the cubby box armrest the cubby box wasn't that big actually with a USB C connector for the infotainment system mm-hmm. but you could link that through to charge the phones in the back if you wanted right okay if you had a long enough cable i think i flew through the buttons there as quickly as possible thank you i appreciate it even if nobody else does <laughs> We mentioned driving a, b- a bit earlier on, and mm. we've gone over the whole the Grand Tour and crossing the continent and all that kind of stuff. Any other specifics around the the uh, around the driving? Really, um, I'd say that it's it's a really decently quiet cabin, although you can get or I had tire noise intrusion. Now I don't know whether that was the particular tires I had. Mm. They were twenty inch, but the particular tires I had, but it was. It, particularly on poorer motorway surfaces, it really came through into the cabin. Right. Um, so that's something to bear in mind. How? I mean, well, was it only an issue because everything else was so dashed quiet? Well, I was what I was about to say is because everything else is so well insulated. I could really hear that. Mm. <laughs> so uh, I think fifteen years ago, twenty years ago, I'd be going. Well, there's a bit of tire noise, but that's it. Because everything else would have been howling and whistling <laughs> anyway. Yeah. But th- so the 1.4, I mean, it, it sounds so strange saying 1.4 and over 200 brake horsepower and all these kind of things in quite a large estate car. Do you just think, gosh, that's going to be slightly terrifyingly rubbish as soon as you want to go anywhere? It, it, it wasn't an issue. It never felt like it was straining or anything. No, it, it never felt underpowered, never felt like it was straining because the the hybrid would kick in and give a little bit of a initial push as well. That helped cut out that dead flat zone. Yes. In when you try and pull away from a junction, you know how much I love that. Mm. And it just, it just got on with the job. I, I'd be pushed if I didn't know to say that it was a 1.4. Okay, okay. And the, the transition between uh, electric and internal combustion engines was – how was that? Was it smooth? Seamless. Okay. Yeah. And, and I mean, that- it, 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 you, you knew when the petrol engine started up, obviously, mm. because it was absolutely silent before, but it, it wasn't that you had to like go through a process or anything. It just, it just seamlessly did it. It, it could realize it was getting towards the end of the battery and would just start at the petrol and you just carried on. Yeah. It made no difference to you traveling along. Right. Right. Okay. Although I do think the 38 miles is rather optimistic. I was going to ask about that uh, a little bit because you've obviously, I mean, as as regular listeners are well aware, you don't have the ability to charge at home. No. So how did you get on with the plug-in hybrid? It arrived full. Right. And I used that up Mm -hmm. and I didn't go and plug it in again because I was one of those horrific FEV drivers. Yes. Two things I'd say here. If I was keeping it longer, I would have got into a routine of charging it at least once a week. Mm -hmm. However, I did always have some electrical drive Mm -hmm. because I was using the regenerative braking, so there was always a minimum amount there. Right. Which would at least mean that I would get out of my road, onto the next road, in electric-only mode, quietly. Okay. Even in my little shuttle runs that i would do Mm -hmm. i'd still be able to regenerate enough back yeah even if the 38 seems optimistic i I know that you do quite you you know obviously school run and the sort of whole dad's taxi thing Mm. would sort of 20 miles 25 miles range see you through most of that generally it would get me through a good couple of days i think Mm. 
uh, as I said with the recent EVs that we talked about, if I had a home charger, this would be just be plugged in. Yeah. I would do so much of my journeys as electric only. Mm-hmm. But to it, it's almost perverse to say this, but to go and charge a FEV feels sometimes on public things, feels sometimes even more of an effort for a limited return. Right. Okay. Even though I know all the positives to do it, Mm -hmm. if I was going somewhere like a a supermarket, then I, oh yeah, I'd absolutely plug it in Mm -hmm. and wait to come back out and the EV owners to throw tins of tomatoes at me or something because I've used up the charger. Organic tomatoes, obviously. Yes. (laughs) But to change my routines and how I get around day to day to go and charge it for 38 miles maximum kind of feels a bit... <sighs> mm-hmm. I know that sounds odd, but it, that's just the sort of the feeling and the mentality I had with it. Okay. I, I did wonder about that because that was... Uh, whenever we were going through some of this, I was slightly surprised. I, it was because I saw that... The only reason I knew it was a fair was because I, I, I saw the, 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 the charger in the, in the boot undercroft. In in the pictures, <laughs> yes. I, I didn't I didn't really know until then. So, okay, that's interesting. If you are looking at a fev and you have the option to get a home charger, it will transform the car for you. Mm-hmm. It really will make it the gateway drug to a full EV for you. Yeah, which is I'm convinced of that. Which is yeah, which is part of the aim of the game, really, isn't it? Yeah, Ultimately. absolutely. Yeah. But there's a lot of research out there stating that. FEVs are the quickest way for us to reduce CO2 emissions. Yeah. If you're in a position where you can do most of your stuff, even a couple of days a week on battery only, then that's 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 a couple of days a week's worth. You know, that's that's yeah. that's two fifths of the of your everyday motoring. More slashed. than you would than you would, because you'd probably be still thinking, oh, I must have a you know, a seven hundred mile tank diesel or hmm. petrol or whatever. Yeah. If more people drop a smaller percentage, then fewer people with the whole 100%, then it will make a much bigger difference. And then you can move people on next after that. Yeah, they're named for the whole everyone at 100 and, and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, that links, I think, across to tech uh, quite nicely. Mm-hmm. Anything other than the, the expected? Um. This is quite well equipped when it came to driver assist, new driver assistance tech. Mm-hmm. So it had uh, adaptive cruise, you expect. Um, but it also had the dynamic road sign display, right. which uses a combination of both the front-facing camera and satellite navigation information. Uh-huh. This was much more wrong than it was right. Really? I'm quite surprised by that. Astonishingly wrong. Okay, gosh, because because uh, I mean I had the ID three similar generation of stuff, and it seemed it was more way more right than wrong. No, the problems I had is it's it was tied into the predictive cruise control, which was part of the package as well, ah. which reads what speed limits are about and will adjust it for you, meaning you don't have to knock it down if you go into a fifty mile an hour zone. Oh, and okay. it was deciding there was old speed limits on some of the roads, ah. which was a bit of a shock for the people following me on the motorway. Yes. Yes. Until I spotted what was going on, and then I had to switch it off. That's unlike the BMW version, which goes, limits changed, and then you actually have to press a button to it to accept what it's saying is the is is the replacement limit. Hmm. That's Considering there was no sign saying that it's fifty mile an hour, and they are, and and this is supposed to be speaking to something that says, but the sat nav information we have here says it should be fifty. Mm. So it's so it can't be live updating, which worries me. Mm. I'm really, really not a fan of that, right? Because we are moving more and more into the territory of the cars deciding what the speed limit we should be doing is Mm -hmm. rather than the driver controlling that. Yeah. And if the information it is inputting is incorrect, things are going to go wrong. Because I was lucky that the speed limits it was deciding were always lower. What happens if I'm in a newly lowered one and it goes 
oh no, we can go quicker. Yeah. Did it did it go back up the way again, by the way, or did it all No, the I, way I had to switch it off and do it. Okay, okay, fair enough. Fair enough. I don't know at what point it was going to spot that it wasn't fifty. Mm-hmm. But but you didn't but want I, everybody. By then you. I was going, I am a moving chicane at this point, so I need to do something about this. Gosh. Okay. Okay. Hmm. So I wasn't impressed with that. Uh, other uh, driver tech includes the lane keeping assist. Side assist and rear traffic alert, uh, travel assist, which fortunately I never had to use. I've, but this can auto accelerate and brake when in a traffic jam. I had, <clears throat> I just re had that, and and it's it was really good. There's no uh, after my concerns with the uh, dynamic road sign display. There is no way I was going to trust that. <laughs> I actually like the, the the Volkswagen implementation of most of these things. That's one of the reasons I'm so surprised about the uh, about the predictive cruise. Uh, there's other cars I've driven recently. If it had had that, I would have expected it to behave that way. But gosh, I, I, I am genuinely surprised by that, given how good the rest of the, that Volkswagen suite generally is. But to give it a plus, the route and the special bit of road that normally triggers an AEB an automatic emergency braking, uh-huh. if it's going to go wrong, it didn't do it. Oh, wow. So it okay. coped with that. So to give it a, a slight tick back mm. in its, in its favour. But the, the other thing and I, I, I wanted to mention is um, there was a nice little touch like that they had when I switched the engine off and I was, I was going, I just got hold of the door and to open up and it, the little message came on the central screen that said, goodbye. Got everything? Question mark. Mobile phone? Question mark. I thought that was a nice little touch. That it was just a look. There's a chance you could forget something here. Just double check. Yeah. And it's not one of those. There is a, something on the back seat. Is it a child? It wasn't that. <laughs> no. It's just a really. Ni- <laughs> it's just. It's just a nice little piece of wording. I, I, as I've seen yeah. that before. I, I, you know, it, it's a kind of standard Volkswagen thing now, and it just. It makes you. F- it makes you feel that the car cares. It's not nagging. It's not preaching at you. It's just a little friendly nudge. Yeah. And I have no problem with that. And it did, by the way, again, the ID3, did, that came up. We got everything mobile phone. I was like, oh, no, I haven't actually. Here we go. Especially if it's on a Qi charger, it's much easier to forget it because there aren't dangly cables and things. Yeah, and and also because we're in and out of so many different cars, mm. where we're storing the phone changes. It's not like yeah. where we store it in our own car. <laughs> it's like the car key. <laughs> oh, don't don't start me. Yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, then. I, I, I'm I'm still not sure quite what you think about this one. To be honest, go on then. What's the Andrew Clues verdict? I really like the looks. Yeah, really, really like the looks. Wish the interior was a bit more exciting. Mm-hmm. And I hated some of the driver assistance tech. No. That's completely unlike you whatsoever. I can see this doing really well with company car drivers, yeah. especially the 26 grams per kilometer CO2. Mm-hmm. It's a good looking thing. It's a, it's a premium car. It's a Volkswagen, so it's going to be on loads of companies' lists. That monthly amount, because it's going to hold its value because secondhand values will be really high. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I can see loads of people going for that. Hopefully, they are not like me and they plug it in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like I say, you know, we only, I only had it for a week. Have it longer than that, and I would adapt to make sure that I was plugging it in because otherwise, I'm lugging around a battery and a motor, not doing too much for me, which is just makes my teeth itch. <laughs> I don't want to do that. So if you're in the market for something like this, particularly company car or um, the benefit in kind Mm -hmm. people, I think you need to go along and test drive it and give it a proper test drive, particularly with some of those extras, and just to see whether you have the same problems I did with them. Because that one in particular could be quite location specific. 
Yeah, I was thinking that, but that was a speed limit that had been lifted a long time ago, right. like as in well yeah, over a month. You do live in the dark ages, you know, but where you are is in the dark ages. D- down here, I did go on the, I did down, go on the motorway down, and they've got electricity and the lights and everything now. It's not like round here where they use candles and a man walking with a <laughs> with a torch down the street at night. <laughs> it's grim up north. <laughs> anyway, if it fits your life si- lifestyle, and you 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 get on with the with the tech, then you recommend it. Yes, yeah, very comfortable, very good looking. You, you are not going to go very far wrong with it if you can get on with it. Brilliant. Okay. Well, thank you for that, and see, thanks to Volkswagen for for, for the press car and stuff. Yep. Um, but folks, uh, don't forget that between now and next time, if you want to know more, you can give us any feedback and share your thoughts for the show at Motoring Podcast on Twitter and Instagram, on Facebook, and on the contact page of motoringpodcast.com, the hub of all our activities. Please don't forget to leave a review and rating on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or however your podcast app lets you do such a thing. Andrew, if people want to know more from you personally, uh, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Best way to get in touch with me is via Twitter. If you search for Crap Windscreen, you should find me there. And Alan, if people would like to know your experiences with the VW infotainment and safety stuff, what's the best way for them to get in touch with you personally? <laughs> I've waffled on about my experiences quite a lot with it tonight. I'm so sorry. Uh, but yes, the best way to get in touch with me is to use Twitter, where I'm at AJP Bradley. That's B R A D L E Y for those of you who like it spelled out. We'll be back before very long. But until then, I've been Alan Bradley. I've been Andrew Clues. And safe motoring.